Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night in the Word. We got a crowd in the house tonight, so we're glad uh, glad you're with us tonight in person and online, and we are grateful for that. Good day to uh, good day to be uh, in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. A couple of things. Uh, on our radar that's probably not been on our radar, <clears throat> but I'm I'm had to put them there. Uh, the uh, National Day of Prayer for our area is tomorrow at noon at the gazebo on the grounds of the Jackson County Courthouse. So uh, the JCMA and and it, any and all who want to come and participate and help help. Uh, pray and minister to minister to the Lord uh, along with think about that happening all over the nation uh, in uh, you know at at one time it's a it's a pretty uh, pretty powerful thing so that'll be that will be tomorrow that hadn't been on anybody's radar uh, that but that will be tomorrow at noon in our area at the Jackson County Courthouse so Excuse me. We'll be uh, we'll be there and uh, working on being per participants in that. And uh, so, if you can make it, if your schedule's not already booked, come on over and and uh, be part and parcel of uh, of the of the assembling of the saints for uh, for the purposeful prayer. So, um, uh, we're going to. We're going to get in the in the word tonight. I want to make sure I got that announcement out while it was fresh on my mind. So it was later. It's hard to tell what will be on my mind. But uh, we have some special prayer requests tonight too. Once we get off off stream, that we will uh, we will do as well. So we've got that stuff going on. But uh, I appreciate Jared did a marvelous job last week. I got to watch it on YouTube. Uh, I think Monday I got to watch uh, his uh, his message on YouTube, and he did a really good job, and and uh, said some, uh, you know, stirred a lot of thoughts on uh, on some things that uh, I thought were pretty uh, pretty pretty interesting pretty interesting uh, vantage points and perspectives. So um, I sent him a text message earlier today and complimented him on it, and and appreciated. Uh, what he did, so it's kind of nice to have that kind of filling in and that kind of help, and I appreciate it. And and uh, everybody that we seem to ask to do this seems to do such a really good job, and I appreciate that. So, um, but uh, so tonight we're going to get back into the feast of first fruits uh, because it's been two weeks since I did the first <laughs> session. The review will be heavy, no doubt. Uh, imagine that, right? Uh, but we'll so it'll be seem a little repetitive, perhaps from the first night. Uh, but uh, just to kind of get us back in the swing of it, and I don't know how how long this will be, but we're I know there'll at least be one more, if not two. So, um, but uh, so we're gonna we're, we're gonna look to the Lord, Father. I thank you tonight, and I bless you. And I ask you, Lord, to uh, direct our steps in your word. I pray, Father, for wisdom. I pray for clarity. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We ask you, Lord, to glorify your name among us and let your word go forth and accomplish that which pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So. Uh, first fruits part two. Uh, we want to uh, kind of go back and recap a little bit. So I'm going to have my notes here in front of me. Um, the, the farmer or a farmer finding budding fruit in his field ties a reed uh, around it to mark it for purpose and verbally declares it as first fruits. And so we we talked about how. This idea projects into Scripture and how, how that, that particular action, how that, uh, that prophetically God declared uh, 
about, you know, in Isaiah 7 and 14, that a virgin would conceive. So in that sense, what, what happens is, is, is that by open declaration, God kind of tied a reed and marked a virgin to be able as the portal for Messiah to enter the world, right? And so that's uh, interesting on that point. And the other is that uh, as Messiah came into the world and began to be revealed to the world, uh, at the uh, at the baptism of Christ, God makes the statement, um, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so that statement is a verbal declaration of the first fruits of sonship that God has positioned and set in the earth to be able to connect and build relationships with humanity through his fatherhood. And so that's a, those, those things are interesting and they are ideas and, and attributes that kind of come into play and they kind of flesh out, not necessarily in, in a deliberate particular way, but in uh, as they project, you start to see how it fits within the context of Scripture. By the way, let me say this too. I said it the first time, and and I'll say it tonight as well. That the information that I give about the uh, about the the historic information comes from a link, uh, a Hebrew website link called Shabbat.org. C H A B A D dot O R G. And it is a Jewish website. It is a Jewish site and it has uh, a lot of information about ancient practices and things that they did. And so uh, if we're going to understand and understand what they're doing, then we need to be able to look back and find it in the context of the time frame in which it's done. So, anyway. The first feast of first fruits begins. It begins the Sabbath following, or excuse me, the first day following the Sabbath of Passover. So it is Resurrection Sunday, right? Uh, it is this. It begins there, but it it is also uh, part of the Feast of Weeks. Right, which is tied into Pentecost. That first day after the Sabbath passes is considered as called the counting of the Omer, and that is a specific day where they begin to count and track toward Pentecost, toward the Feast of Pentecost. And so it's 50 days from that day after the Sabbath, of after following Passover, to Pentecost is 50 days, and so that they begin to count on that day, and so there's a counting every day. I believe, and I never looked at it this way before until I looked at some of these, some of this information, that that's where, that's where the idea of a Feast of Weeks fits in, because you have people that are, uh, that are making the pilgrimage, that are traveling in, carrying and with, on carts and baskets and things they are they are moving from different regions to come and dedicate their first fruits unto the Lord to consecrate their fruit so that there will be a full harvest toward the end okay and so it's it's important i think to grasp the rea the realization that Jesus raises from the dead on the very day of first fruits and thus thus he certifies and guarantees that there will be a harvest of sons in the earth that there will be a group of born again believers that the earth will have a harvest have a full and and, uh, and blessed and abundant harvest of believers and faith in the earth that will that is designed to connect us to the fatherhood of God and so uh, so this becomes a very uh, you know we, we see it in that one instance but there's also the the uh, continual people still migrating in. And, and so we're going to talk about some of those things today. 
We talked about the rabbinical position that it was considered that it was, I think the rabbinical value was 1 60th of the crop is what was designated as first fruits. So you had to figure that whatever they were bringing, they were anticipating 60 times more in the harvest than what they were bringing to the feast to dedicate to the, to dedicate uh, to the Lord. Now, I believe Jesus used a bit of a sliding scale on that, and when he did, uh, he said he used the scale a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. So I believe that the the idea of of one sixtieth is is not uh, just a hard fast rule. It might be for some, but I believe Jesus was looking at this from a from a superabundant hundredfold, the traditional rabbinical position of sixtyfold, and then and I think that's in Matthew chapter ten. And so it, he then he goes in to say, you know, if you can't do that, but thirtyfold is still an increase and still a blessing. So we're looking at a, a a sacrifice, an offering, if you will, brought to the Lord that says, "I believe you for the increase." Yes. I believe you to bless the harvest. Yes. I believe that what I bring and dedicate and offer to you, you will breathe on it. You will you will increase it. You will cause it to grow. You will yes. cause it. You will make it to prosper. You will work and accomplish uh, uh, to my benefit uh, and, and for your glory a great blessing in the earth. And so that's. Uh, catching this cord on something here. I think it's uh, my chair, but anyway, I'll try not to pull it off my head. So, you know, and, and the thing too that we talked about last week was about the baskets. We talked about the feeding of the 5,000 out of John's gospel and of John chapter six. And, and in that we, we kind of introduced the idea that, 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 the context for that miracle was following Passover, and they had sailed across to a, uh, you know, the Sea of Tiberias, and they had uh, a bunch of folks in the wilderness that were hungry, right? So it's in that in that window when the baskets used, which were woven out of uh, grass and reeds, that they carried and brought the first fruits in that those baskets were probably why, the baskets that were used to pass out the food, to collect the fragments that nothing be lost. I was always wondered where the baskets came from, right? I always, where could, why baskets? And if it's in that time frame, then baskets would have been, you know, in, at everybody's hand, fingertips, or at their elbow. So that kind of... I'm satisfied with that. Now, I can't tell you that absolutely for sure, for certain that that's, you know, that's how it was, but it fits the time frame, it fits the pattern, and it looks good from where I'm sitting. So, you know, you take that with, you know, however, if you've got a, a different revelation on the baskets, then, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, we, we just, you know, just kind of work through that. But, so we'll, uh, now we're going to get into some other information tonight. We're not going to be terribly word heavy, but we are going to talk about some of the stuff that, that the pictures, and that's the, you know, to me, that's the great joy of my heart is that when you start looking at some of these things and you can catch a glimpse of a, of a picture or an image from scripture that you are well acquainted with and you start to see it in some of this stuff, okay? So <clears throat> let's get into, I think we've finished the review. And so uh, the pilgrims or the wayfarers, whatever you want to call them, bringing their offerings to temple, they travel, they only travel two thirds of a day at a time. You say, why that? Why only two-thirds of a day? They don't, they don't appear to be in a hurry to get there. 
But as they travel and, and others are traveling that general direction, there is a confluence or a flowing together of people. And so they become, they, they become a caravan. They become, uh, you know, they, they, become, they become partners in, in getting to Jerusalem. And so what they do is they start to flow together and they begin to encourage one another and they speak well and they're, it's a positive experience. They've just had Passover. They're, they're, they are, uh, you know, anticipating and expecting the blessing of the Lord on their harvest and on their crops, uh, on, the, on their land and on their families. And so there is this, there is this, there is this, uh, just this positive energy that's generated among them and as they as in every place they stop they just they, they continue to pick up more travelers and more people with the same purpose with the same desire with the you know I, I think in uh, the epistle of first I don't know whether it's first or second Peter some of you can check it and see but he talks about finding people of like precious faith and so this, you know, that's a, that correlates into this because you're, you're building a brotherhood, if you will. You're building community. You're, you're coming together with purpose and agreement and, and a, 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 an excitement and a sense of meaning and purpose for what's in front of you, right? And so, so there's, this, there's this continual... Uh, you know, growing and increasing uh, a company of uh, uh, of pilgrims that are headed to offer their their first fruits to the Lord, and so they are, uh, you know, they they encourage themselves in their purpose, and they and you know it it permits hope for the future. It just it just builds something. See, that's, that's part of what happens, I think, when we come together. That's part of why the, the, uh, you know, the author of Hebrews says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Because we all share similar purpose because we are all blessed and affected by the great Savior of uh, of us all, which is Christ Jesus, and so that that experience and and that purpose yes. and that desire to please and that desire to uh, follow Him uh, is something that we that that moves us. And when we come together, and again, we have a, a, a likeness and a and a uh, a preciousness that that we connect with. It builds community, and it builds, gives us direction, and it and it encourages us along the way. And if you might be participating in this, and and it may be your first your your first foray into this, you may be you know maybe relatively new to it. You begin to draw strength from from the folks who've been at this, from the folks who've been doing it. There's just a there's just a mutual benefit. To come in together with a singleness of purpose and and the and the realization that we are here to honor and to bless the Lord because we bless Him, He's blessed us already. Yeah. But if we continue to bless Him, then our blessing is just going to enlarge. It's yeah. just going to grow and increase, right. right? So so that's that's very important for. Uh, you know that's one of the things that that is, you know, it, it's kind of uh, there's a lot of folks that that are kind of content to stay away, and so I want to not to attack or to uh, or to chastise here, but I want us to understand that there's nothing like being in the house, yes. particularly when there's when the spirit of God is moving in the house. Mm -hmm. There's just there's no substitute for that. Yes. Now. Joining us online is helpful and it's good and you get some of that and some sense of that as you, as you view it and watch it, but it's not the same as being in the atmosphere of his presence 
with your family, with your friends, with the people that that share your 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 goals and your dreams to to honor and to bless and to serve the Lord. There's there's, there's something there's something uh, uh, weighty and there's something uh, uh, there's substance to that. Let me get that out right there. So anyway, so they would. So these folks would sleep in the street. They slept in their wagons. They did not go into houses to avoid contamination, right? Because all that stuff is real, um, very prominent. In, you know, I mean, that's evident from all the stories in the gospel about the about the lepers and the and you know and sinners and everybody kind of you want to keep them at distance. And we see how Jesus did so very well with all those rules. Uh, you know, he kind of he, he kind of renewed us in the rule of loving people takes priority over, over a lot of these other rules. And so what he did was he he showed us a way forward that in that is inclusive for all people. Whether they whether male or female, whether they are whole or or or, or damaged, whether they are uh, you know, in the right frame of mind or, or not in a good frame of mind at all, he still reached to those people and he, he made, uh, you know, he, he connected with them. And that's, that's part of our mission. It's part of our, uh, I'll call it a mandate. I should call it a God date, I guess, because it's divine and it is not just, it's not just man, you know, fabricated or man-made. Uh, it is God showing us the kind of man that's in the image and likeness of God to reveal image and likeness, the God's image and likeness in those who have lost track of it, yeah. in those who haven't seen it or don't sense it or believe it to be relevant or, or that they are connected to. So this is part and parcel of uh, there's so much in this, and I, I was thinking about being able to lay your head down and rest in in your purpose, and having that focus, that singleness of purpose to to move toward what you believe God wants for your life in this season, and to be able to live there, to be able to sleep there, to be able to walk that out, and then be able to uh, uh, find your rest and a haven in that. That's that's uh, that's awesome to me because that's just you know right up my alley so to speak. But uh, so they they would spend the night and they would be awakened every morning with this particular shout, and it was this. I want to get it right here. So it's uh, so you have so let's say your caravan's been growing and you've got. 30 or 40 carts, and in others who don't have carts, they've just got baskets. And when it's morning and it's time to start the travel, particularly since you're only traveling two-thirds of the day, you hear, arise and let us ascend to Zion, to God our Lord. Every day starts with that statement. Arise. Let us... Arise and let us ascend to Zion, to the Lord our God, or to God our Lord. Let me say it that way. That's the wake up and the get moving cry. That's the alarm each day along the way. And how uplifting, how encouraging it keeps the height of the vision in front of you, right? Yeah. What it does is it says, Wake up, rise up. We're called to ascend to Zion. We're going to the high place. We're going to the high mountain. And there we're going to find God our Lord. That's where we're going to go. And what we're doing is pleasing him, right? And so as I was thinking about that and the, uh, you know, and the first fruit company, uh, you know, go ahead and put my first scripture up, Gabe. I think it's in. Hebrews 12. So think about this. He didn't say let's go back. See, there's so often, so often our language and our thinking is to try to get back somewhere else. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right? It is, it's to try to recover and get back to where we used to be. Yeah. Where God is always saying, come up higher. God's always saying, ascend, climb higher, meet with me, come with me, let's ascend the heights, come away with me, my love, right? Out of the Song of Solomon, come and, come and, and, and walk with me, come and find a, a, a place of, of joy and peace and love and laughter, come find that with me. And so I got to looking at this, and I was thinking, he didn't say, he didn't say, get up, everybody, we got to go back to Sinai. <laughs> no. He didn't say that. So let's go, we're in, we're in Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to start, I want to read verses 18 and 19, and we're going to jump down and go to verse 22. But he says, for you are not come. Hebrews 12 and 18, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken unto them anymore. Now this is the, this is the retelling, if you will, of the Sinai experience in the desert. And so as believers and in the new covenant, he says, you're not come to the mount that might, that might be touched at burned with fire, blackness, darkness, and tempest. You didn't come. We're not, we haven't come to Mount Sinai. No. This is not our mountain. No. The mountain of, of, of legalism, the mountain of, uh, uh, of rules on rocks and, and regulations at the cost of human, uh, you know, of, of human success. All of that stuff, not what we're, that's not the mountain we're called to. And so I find it important that in the first fruits, the statement is, arise, let us ascend to Zion. Zion was the highest peak overlooking Jerusalem. By the way, there were seven of those peaks around Jerusalem. So just as a, as a sidebar, there were seven mountains that, nest, that Jerusalem nested in. So, you know, I, I know most folk, when they, when they read in Revelation and talk about the city that sits on seven hills, they immediately think Rome. But Jerusalem's been the culprit all along, and so I'm going to tell you that that's, he's not talking about Rome in that passage of Scripture. I don't want to get... I don't want to tag that in here, but I just just as a as an aside and for your personal edification, <laughs> I'm just going to drop that on you tonight. But but he says, arise and let us ascend to Zion. Let us ascend. We are climbing the heights. What mountain are we coming to in the first fruit? What is the first fruit brings us to Zion? It doesn't take us back to what was. It doesn't take us back to, uh, to a, a mountain that, that terrified uh, everybody. So great, this goes on to say, so great was the, was the shaking and the, uh, and the fury of the mountain, the, the tempest, that Moses himself, the guy that climbed the mountain, said, I exceedingly fear and tremble. I fear and I'm, I'm shaking like a leaf. And that was a pretty good recovery. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm shaking like a leaf. I am, I'm uh, not real comfortable with this. And he's the mediator of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And so it is, it, it, it's, I don't believe it's a mistake or a coincidence that when it comes to the first fruit, we're not going to Sinai. Hallelujah. So let's jump down to verse 22. We're still in Hebrews 12. And he says, you're not come to this mountain, but he says in verse 22, but you are come unto Mount Zion. So there it is. So the call for first fruit and the call that should strike us and resonate with us as, as uh, the uh, fruit of a first fruit company of a firstborn, first fruit son, of a of a group of the the descendants, if you will, of of a first fruit company of believers 
that and and to be perhaps the first fruit of, of, a, of a group of people in your region. Because there's times in the book of Acts that that it's mentioned about a certain group of people being the first fruits of Achaia. That they are that they are that, that, so they become the first fruit offering for a region and for a city or for a for a a, a, a you know an area that says God says you're a first fruit company here, so you wave and you present yourself before the Lord, and I have, I will bless the harvest, I will increase, I will, I will blow on it in a way that will that will uh, increase and enlarge and amplify and magnify my work in your life, so that more will believe, so that you will have a greater sense. Of, of uh, fruit and harvest in your area will be abundant, will be blessed, and will be filled with all of the goodness of God. And so I, I, I think that uh, he says, but you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly, <coughs> excuse me, and church of the firstborn. So remember that, because first fruit is not used in here, but the phrase firstborn is. Which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. <clears throat> but you and I are come to the church of the firstborn. Now in Luke 2, and I think it's in Matthew 1, Jesus is referred to as Mary's firstborn son, right? In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, he is referred to as the firstborn among many brethren. So that's part of the first fruit Format, right? Or template, I'll call it. That's probably a better word. So he came as the only begotten son, but he didn't intend to stay the only son, right? He came and he, he presented himself in a way that he was the first fruit and the firstborn so that many sons could come into his glory. That's the, the effect of the life of Jesus is the sonship that the world is, steps into by faith. So in Colossians 1 and 15, he is the firstborn of all creation. Now, King James says of every creature, but, but if you look at it probably in its more uh, literal form, he's the firstborn of all creation. So that, that idea that we talked about and we've talked about before at length on Wednesday nights about Messiah resetting creation, he is the firstborn. Creation is now in his image, in his likeness. Everything about everything about what it means to be a man in the image and likeness of God, we discover it in him. Everything that we read and we find about God, we should see the face of Jesus in it. Because he showed us the Father, right? He revealed the invisible God. He was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So creation was reborn, reformed, remade in the first fruit of the sonship of Jesus. And you and I are called to the church of the firstborn. Mount Zion. We are ascended Zion, and on Zion, Zion is not just a place apart from on Zion and in Zion, it unlocks all of these, what looks like separate places, but it unlocks all of these dimensions of glory, yeah. right? So it is, so when we, as we ascend to Zion in the first fruit, in the, in, in the integrity of the first fruit, then we, it, we realize that we're the city of the living God that the, and, and the heavenly Jerusalem, we discover it to be there, right? 
and an innumerable company of angels. We got company on this trip. We got company. We, you know, we're keeping company with angels. That shouldn't be something that is a uh, that that is an anomaly. We are called to a mountain that angels have positioned themselves to uh, and stationed themselves to stand in and to be part and parcel of what God is saying in the earth. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, written in heaven, to God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator, it all comes back into him, right? Because he's the mediator of a better covenant. Remember, in that on that other mountain, that mediator was feared and quaked. But on this one, Jesus stands and he's speaking better things than the blood of Abel. He speaks better things than his blood speaks of healing. It speaks to heal humanity, to make us whole, to save us, to deliver us. Whereas Abel's blood cried from the earth, uh, 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 having been wronged and having been murdered and having been ill-treated and abused. See, the blood of Jesus now stands to speak healing and recovery and restoration from the abuses of the past. Praise the Lord. So that's, uh, I, I think that's just a powerful thing to think about. We're ascending to Zion. A desire for uh, that what brings us there is a desire for a better harvest. Climbing the heights of a new and fresh perspective. A God that showed himself great and mighty. A God who saves to the uttermost. A God who does not break covenant. A God who says, I will never leave you. I won't leave you or forsake you. A God who says, uh, you know, yeah, you know, no man can pluck you out of my hand. Uh, you know, hallelujah. There's, there's some powerful things that belong to us on this mountain that did not belong on the other mountain. So it's important that we catch the reality that the first fruit of Jesus, the thing that he did, was done to bring us all into this Dramatic, abundant harvest of grace and truth and peace and joy and righteousness. Now, in Colossians 1 and 18, he is also called the firstborn from the dead. So, and in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's the first fruit of those who are raised from the dead, right? So, so, there, that, so the correlation is there. <clears throat> Excuse me. It may not literally say first fruit, but firstborn and first fruit kind of run along parallel lines. So, now, getting back into some of this other information. <clears throat> We're going to talk about two elements of how the caravan is led. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there's two elements. The first one is there is a cart at the front that is pulled by an ox that has gold-coated horns and, uh, and, an, and a crown of olive branches. And he is the, uh, um, he is the ox is a, or bullock, I'll say, is a, both a sacrificial and a service animal, Right? And he is at the front of the, of the caravan. He is leading the caravan as far as the physical elements and aspect of it. And so think about this for a minute. Let's go to, to our last set of scriptures here. And it's uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. This is a, this is a site, C-I-T-E, of... The eighth psalm, by the way, and I, most of you probably already knew that, but we'll just put that out there. Um, but we're going to read verses 6 through 13 out of Hebrews chapter 2. 
says, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now you, we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him <clears throat> for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. <clears throat> for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee, and again I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. I'm going to stop there. There's more that's probably relevant, but I'm going to stop there. Because what I'm after here is that there is the idea of the ox leading the way. The ox is a, is a service animal and a sacrificial animal. And so it speaks it's to me, and he is, he's got gold-coated or gold-painted horns, and he has a crown of olive branches on him. See, the olive branch was the sign that the dove brought back to Noah, saying the flood waters had receded. So it was the first glimmer of hope that the world's going to heal, that the world's going to be something more. It's going to be recovered and restored. The very first element of hope that was brought back to the ark was that olive branch. And so there's a crown of that. So there is gold is glory and crown is in this. And so we're looking at we're looking at a sacrifice and a service that is designed to be crowned with glory and honor. And so this fits into the, the text here as a sacrifice that would, be, that would be a crowning sacrifice, a sacrifice that would be glorious in that it would change the outcome and make the world prosper and be at peace and be blessed because he's a first fruit offering, right? And so we have that physical element that testifies and, and, and that leans into this passage of Scripture. But the other one, the other element, is a little more, uh, it's a little, um, how do I say this? A little more abstract. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm getting at here is that not only did the, the ox cart led the caravan, because we follow something solid, right? We follow something that was tangible for us. We follow, we take up our cross and follow Christ because he, as the, as the first fruit ox, crowned with glory and honor, went to a place of sacrifice so that you and I would, would find our way into the very presence of God as the sons and daughters of God. So he crowned him with suffering, and you and I now have, have a, a greater purpose beyond our own cross and our own suffering and our own problems and our own difficulties that now we can, we can uh, we, they will not overwhelm us because we can contrast them with his suffering. We can, we can uh, kind of uh, mitigate them, if you will, mitigate our own difficulties in the light of his suffering. We find, our, we find some relief because of his suffering was so much greater, right? And that's part of the fellowship. I believe that's part of the fellowship of his suffering that Paul talks about in, in Philippians chapter 3. But on the outside of this, there is a flute player who is, who 
is always playing a flute. He's always playing that music. As people are following together and encouraging one another in the way or on the path, in the journey, let's call it that because there's so much, so often these days we hear people talking about the journey. You know, the, the destination is the journey in many ways. It's about how we walk this out. All right? Anyhow, the, in, in the kind of in the creating the atmosphere and adding to that is the sound of the flute player, is the sound of a flute that is kind of leading them, encouraging them, and filling the air around them. And so I've talked about this a little bit in relationship to the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> but in Jewish, in ancient Judaism, the flute, the flute player was considered the pierced one. So let me say this. The song or the prophecy about the Messiah, about his life, about his all that he would accomplish. This is all playing in the air around us as we travel, right? This is, this is the song of the Lamb. Let me say it to you that way. And so, uh, so that song's been playing for years, and we, we catch maybe glimpses, uh, uh, and, and we hear, is that music I hear in the travel? Is somebody got the radio on? Is something, you know, do, do I hear something and there's music? And if you can identify it and, and, and realize it, then there's something meaningful about it, right? Yeah. So, so all along this journey, there is the pierced one song is the accompaniment to the, to the trip. It's the accompaniment to the journey. All the prophetic voice, all of the, all of the scripture, all of the Psalms, all of the Proverbs, all of the, the, the statements of the law talking about the hope that Messiah is bringing and the, and the redemption that the patriarchs laid their heads down in faith to, uh, uh, to believe would happen. This is part of the song of the pierced one that is filling the, the, the atmosphere as they journey to ascend into Zion. Praise God. And so that kind of, that gets me, you know. I mean, that kind of, you can tell it kind of does a little bit of something for me, right? Yeah. And so that's, a, that's, that's, not everybody hears the lyrics. Sometimes you just catch the melody and you think, I should know that song. Right? But some days you're not you're not fully concentrating on it. You're not perhaps you hear it and you've been hearing it and I hear music and then you think, I wanna know that that sounds familiar. And so what do you do? You start paying more attention to it to try to discern the song, to try to figure out what's being played. What is this that's hitting my ears? And so it's the pierced one. It's the it's the Willing sacrifice of Messiah who has, who, uh, who has been singing of his love for us for ages and generations. Yeah. It was held in mystery and held in, uh, in, uh, in shadow and type. It was held in, a, in, 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 a, in encryption in the word and encoded, embedded, if you will, in culture and in, and, and in uh, uh, lifestyle and in all of these things. And so when you find him, then you start to, you start to extract and, and extrapolate out of that what you've been hearing and you start to put the things together and it starts to cause you to say, oh, that's what that is, yeah. right? And now, now you've got something that is, uh, that is adding a little bit of lightness to your step, to your stride. Maybe it lengthens your stride a little bit. Maybe it adds some joy to the journey. Or it fills you with comfort and peace because you know that he's got you along the way that 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 what's what you are leaning into and what you are following is the path because you're hearing the song of the lord and the song of the lamb and you're hearing it and it's it's causing you to want to go higher yeah. it's causing you to want to move forward it's causing you to want to uh, present all that you are yeah. right 
Romans 12 and 2 says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Yeah. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Yeah. It's not even above and beyond the call of duty. It is, it just makes sense. Why? Because we're following his example. We're listening to his song. And his song was one of selflessness. His song was one of willing, will, willingly giving himself for the benefit of others and for us all. And so now that becomes, that becomes part and parcel of the sonship that we inherited. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anyway. And he plays, and as they near Jerusalem, they send out emissaries. They send out runners. Oh. They send people out and say, hey, we got a caravan coming from the eastern regions of the kingdom. And they're coming. So that the city then begins to rejoice because they're coming into the town. They're coming in to fulfill and to bring their first fruit. It's going to be a good harvest. We're going to, we're going to celebrate the crop. We're going to celebrate with them, right? And so the flute player plays until the priests come out and meet them. And when the priests come out and meet them and the temple delegates and they meet them, then they escort them into the city. And as they walk into the city, there's joy, there's celebration, there's, there's, it, 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 there's, a, there's a positive vibe. Can I say it to you that way and not hurt your feelings any? There's just a good old positive vibe in the streets. Good stuff happening. I mean, and, 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 but in that, then the flute player continues to play until they get to the temple mount. And when they get there, then we'll get into that next week and we'll start to look at some of that stuff. But this is as far as I wanted to get tonight. But uh, let me see if I've gotten anything else here. I haven't, I haven't covered. That's pretty much got me where my uh, final thought I want to leave us with is that ultimately Messiah brings us to a place brings us to a new temple, brings us to a, a new place and a place of blessing. And he stands good. He stands good. He is our advocate yes. with the Father, right? Yes. And, and so, you know, and, and if you want to believe it's that there's banter between Father and Son, that's, you know, that's, I'm okay with you seeing this however you want to see this. But, but how my perspective of it is, is that because he's in the presence of God, we belong in the presence of God. Yes. That he represents us in that place. And that, that we have, that's why we have boldness yes. to come into the throne room, yes. to find grace, to help in time of need. Yes. Yes. And, and so he stands good for us. He's the surety. This, the book of Hebrews, in an, I think it's in chapter 7 or chapter 8, calls him the surety of a better covenant. That means he guarantees it, he certifies it, and he has, he has legitimized the covenant by his resurrection. And he stands good for our salvation and for our ability to belong in the presence of God. And so that's all part and parcel of a first fruit thing. And so he stands good for our blessed fruitfulness, that you and I can be blessed. And again, that brings us back to John 10 and 10. He said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I've come to bless you. I've come to position you to be blessed. I've come to stand good for that blessing. Everything that the law demanded, I will satisfy so that you can stand in the place of satisfaction from the demands of the law and you can stand and you can live there and you can move there and you can have your being in that spot. So he stands good for our blessing 
for our favor, yes. for all that we could ever have wildly imagined. And then I don't think we're close sometimes. What is it Paul said? He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above yes. all that we can ask or think. Yes. And for some of us that have vivid imaginations, that's really good news, right? Because I can, I can dream up some pretty decent scenarios. And so I think that, that you know, if he, can, if he can outdo all of that, then, man, I'm just going to enjoy the blessing. I'm just yeah. going to receive with, with, with great thankfulness, with gratitude, and with blessing, I want to receive his, his blessing in his life. So, praise the Lord. We have probably at least one more uh, thing, some more stuff to cover maybe next week. We might have two more sessions of this. We'll see. But we'll, we're going to kind of work our way through it. It's more than just a one-time shot on that Sunday morning uh, after the Passover. I used to think it was just that one time. That was the counting of the Omer. Next week, we'll get into them bringing their gifts in. Once they reach the temple mound, they have to leave the oxes out. And they have to shoulder. Every man has to put his basket on his own shoulder and carry it into the temple and offer it to the priest. And then it's placed by the brazen altar. It's placed on the south side of the brazen altar. Anyway. We'll be looking at some of that stuff next week and getting into some of that. And then, then we, what I want to do is take this and, and bring a bigger picture in some other areas with it. So anyway, Father, I thank you, thank you for your word tonight. And I pray, Father, that your people have been encouraged. I pray, Father, that, that our hearts have been, uh, have been uh, uplifted. I pray, Father God, that you would glorify, that you have glorified your name and that you will continue to glorify it. I pray, Father, that all you want to communicate out of this series, Father God, that you would bring it forth for your name, for the glory of your name, and for the honor of your kingdom. We give you praise, we give you blessing, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we give you blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Uh, if you're in the Jackson County area, don't forget um, the uh, National Day of Prayer tomorrow at the gazebo at the Jackson County Courthouse at noon. So, um, so uh, I don't know whether we've got some, um, we have something going on this weekend or not. Do I need to announce something? Mother's Day. Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! I about forgot Mother's Day. Poor old feller. Anyway, <laughs> we will be uh, we'll be doing the uh, Mother's Day luncheon on Sunday, right? Or Saturday? I'm sorry, Saturday. Twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. All right. Good deal. See, you know, we've gone from breakfast to lunch to Saturday to Sunday and back to Saturday. <laughs> Just in the fumbling of announcements, that's uh, we're 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 doing good. Saturday, twelve thirty. Praise the Lord. Linda and we and Linda McClung will be sharing a message to the lady, to the moms, and then we will be uh, honoring our mothers on Sunday. So, Amen. All right. Thanks for joining us.